you guys have viewers. Also, so there was a lovely um, open networking event uh, in this building next month, actually. So, oh, no. If you're interested in that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Do you guys publish it somehow? Our, uh, our research. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, but it's internal, so it's, in, it's Oh, no, I meant not your research, but yeah, more the events that you host here. Yeah, yeah. It should be on the uh, yeah. I have no idea what that is, but I'll look it up. I think they usually, for external parties, it usually shows up in the specific company, so this was advertised on sort of the OpenStack website. Which up, I don't know if there's a, is there a centralized? Yeah, but that calendar is this probably the most central point for Stuff that fidelity needs to go off with. Yeah, and I'm, I'm here because I talked with Keith Shin and uh, LP Stack. So the last one, I mentioned, you know, trying to, uh, we were having a hack day in New York City that got rained out, hurricane out, I guess. Um, and uh, he's like, oh, you should come to Boston. Yeah, and so, okay. So I'm here and I'm in New York uh, Thursday. The theater and stuff are all over the world. So, yeah. Uh, Okay, well, thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, start with the uh, sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm from Cloud Technology Partner here across the channel. My name is Tom Crew. Um, I've worked on some consulting engagements with some clients, but also support currently on a product we're working on for a uh, code analysis product for um, uh, a job, uh, deciding um, how capable your code is with different cloud platforms and working in the structure on that product as well. Yeah. Beth Cohen, also from Cloud Technology Partners, and active in the OpenStack community. I keep promising I'm going to write documentation to get around to it. Um, but I've done a number of OpenStack deployments, so I actually know what it takes to actually deploy it, which means it's very painful. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always looking for ways to improve deployments. Cool. Uh, I'm Craig Tracy. I am the DevOps tech lead at a company called HubSpot. Uh, probably no one knows what HubSpot does, but we are a. Um, that's it. We, 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 we are a basically a single single marketing SaaS product for marketing, um, whether it be email marketing, content generation, uh, handling leads, you name it. We have a very large presence in Amazon right now, which we are in the process of migrating towards. Mm -hmm. Hey, doing everyone. I'm Tim Green. I work for Opscode. I'm a solutions architect based out of New York City. And really excited to be here and hopefully get to see some of you at um, Meetup so that you can work on code. Good morning. My name is Mike Hall. I'm with Opscode. I'm a strategic account manager. My support accounts here in the Northeast. Can you talk about uh, Dennis Call from the Red Hat System Engineer. We know what we're doing. My name is Austin Swinney. I also work with Red Hat. My name is Rob Hirschfeld. I work with Dell. Uh, I also have the privilege of being on the board for the OpenStack Foundation. So if you have issues or challenges or want to talk about that, Politics of it. I'm happy to discuss that with you. Uh, so, although today we're here to hack, so uh, I was going to let you give a presentation. No, <laughs> we're here so to we hack. One ready to go. Oh, yeah. um, Congratulations on your reelection. Thank you very much. I'm excited. Um, we have. There's a lot of. There's a lot. We can, I can. I, if you want, we can take a break at some point, and I can talk about some of the issues that are coming up and, and what um, people should pay attention to and advocate around based on what their positions are. Because uh, uh, our our job is to listen to the community, not to not to invent not to invent issues. Um, also, I had a question about hashtags and using hashtags. Do you have okay. a preference? I mean, I was thinking we could use OSFOS because that's what the OpenStack uh, local OpenStack mm -hmm. community OS uses. Boss. OS BOS. Okay. okay. Uh, for chef, it's Hop Chef. Yeah. yeah, I use that. Is there is there a boss? Does the Boston Chef group have a hashtag? I don't know if they do the group chef. Oh, for some reason, Fidelity apparently blocks meetup.com, so that explains why you're not on there. Ah. It's, it's horrible, evil, but 
the Chef Group and the OpenStack Group happen to organize theirs. So, so, yeah. Yeah. so good. Um, oh, so I'm Andy. I worked with Rob at Dell. Um, see, been. I don't really have much more to say about that. <laughs> Andy's active on uh, a I'm, lot of the cookbooks for Crowbar. Yeah. Specifically, Swift. So you might be I think I wrote one of the first ones out there. Yeah. I also help. Um, well, I started organizing and help organize the OpenStack uh, Boston Meetup Group. Actually, the the history is kind of interesting. It started the first event was seeded by Fidel. You guys actually pulled together uh, an event right. I actually missed that one because I'm out of the country, and we it's it's pretty active. So if you guys are interested in OpenStack. Use your cell phone to get them to meetup.com, openstack <laughs> dash Boston, and uh, you'll find it. Um, I'm Peter Pouliot. Uh, I work for Microsoft. Um, I actually I spoke at that. Uh, but I've been driving the OpenStack on Hyper V movement. So I'm the only person uh, at Microsoft who works full time on OpenStack. Um, that includes a lot of different things from uh, beyond. But um, yeah, we're we're doing good. If you haven't checked it out and you want to know more about it, please come see me after. But, we're gonna talk about it today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Kyle Shimano, I'll be probably in and out. Or out and in and say, yeah, I might manage the balance team for our internal class. I mean, I work for each of our folks. And then I've got one of my guys here, so he's my representative. I'll be asking him you know, how it's going and how we're, how we're doing as far as open sec open shop. And we've got, I shouldn't say we, he is installed open sec in our lab and has upgraded from S6 to full, something actually we need right now to make it help here to. Upgrade Swift to 165 to leverage the three interface for some tests. Um, I don't know that we'll do too much with open science until after the first quarter because of a lot of the priorities that a definite interest in sports and chef and chef comps is probably the right for that all the time to speak. So, um, all good things. More than better. I'm Sundar Laxman. I work with the investments. And uh, you know, I've been working with Kyle on, uh, on the, one of the open site applications that uh, we have. Did you all, did you guys use a disco or did you install a hand? Or? Uh, it was interesting trying to leverage out. Um, we had a little bit of support at the time. I, I think they were being the direct. So, sorry, are you installing it for research purposes or for eventual usage yes. purposes? Yes. Because if I understood <laughs> you correctly, you're, you're researching it from the investment perspective of like right. whatever, so not we, for actual use. So, you know, OpenStack was ready when we got the file going. Mm -hmm. um, there was code there, it just wasn't ready from our perspective, so we started writing on our own. Uh, and we're looking to then replace a, a good chunk of what we have familiar for the percent computer <laughs> chart that would compute some um, so what we have right now is uh, it's in server and then a lot of our code is very similar setup uh, and looked to architecture and some of the stuff I did in the past. Um, we didn't use messaging at the time so basic flow was very similar. So we approach it was funny because then we looked at uh open set code and it was like oh What's uh, one of our other business partners, they, they had a similar architecture. So um, we, were, we wrote for Zen server only, and then we're looking to leverage OpenStack as kind of a shoe more into the KDM because we had that in the interest of KDM. Mm -hmm. uh, we did look at um, Crowbar. It's, a, it's an internal joke here because Crowbar is, uh, is incredible, but we can use it for Zen server at the time. Yeah. Support. It's, I, I was actually 
warring back and forth with my boss. He's like, we should be using crowbars to pull out. I was like, well, fair now to go and pull out. And so we go back and forth. And finally, when I said, you know, good luck. And it's like, Shay, I'm going to have to look. That's what we're going to do. And then the it's interesting. Okay, we'll keep using it on the road. And, uh, so that was that. But um, I think we're going to get back to something that was a service for our top one on the rest of the trip. So anyway, that, that is key maybe more interesting research. We're definitely very interested in the actual deployment of the use of um, to, to enable more hypervisors to reduce our code base. Our code base is very small compared to the open source stuff we use, so we have a good story to tell you know, in, in that context. Um, but the same offer where we can leverage a bigger development team. Yeah, I think so. so. Uh, on that note, have you? Uh, I really no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> I have, I have, have, have you? Are you? I guess uh, strategically thinking about joining the foundation at any point. Um, we have involvement, like myself, and um, Shayla and some others on our team uh, registered. Okay. Uh, okay. And we have oh, looked at some of the other. I know that's a difficult process in some cases. It can be, um, especially in the financial institution. You know, financial institutions where there's a lot of regulation, proprietary IP, and you know, just that. I mean, we, we're able to we're able to sponsor in some cases. You know, the question was, you know, what's the right entry point for, for the value? So obviously, HP and I mean, you know, most people throw on that kind of money. They have a hold of the details, but all the details. We're very involved in open you know, so good network issues. With being involved, the question is where you now legal is, is a massive, you know, and yep. obviously, um, legal is all the pain. Trust me, before. trust me, I know <laughs> that would probably be the biggest hindrance, but you know, we're not, we're not first. It's, you know, where, where do we land? I'm sorry, so this is for prior to the product and for the cloud. Where do we land as far as registered, uh, builders that open tab? Um. So we're still in investigating where to jump in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we haven't engaged legal. We haven't engaged legal. So we haven't engaged legal. We have the paperwork started for contributing and so forth. Started. It's still in the hospital where we're completing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was looking at the list the other day. There are 196 companies. I'm like curious where does so PayPal like, fit in the PayPal is on the list. Well, these guys, yeah. Hello. Um, <laughs> what was the question? Uh, where do you guys fit on the using OpenStack involvement with the foundation and on stuff uh, like that? Uh, can, you move out can you speak up so that folks will? Yeah, sorry. basically trying to move out from the workspace and um, to our own. Mm -hmm. So you're still kind of early research or yeah. so you get to build out your own space and put yourself. Yeah. I think that's where HubSpot is as well, right? Yeah. We already have we're not we're not actually in production yet, we have our environment off that rack space. Um, and it's in the process of getting apps ready to migrate over. Exactly, because you guys will get that quick service. No, we actually we get some pretty good rates. We get a lot of premium support from Amazon. People always think it's about cost. It's not about cost for us. It's about controlling the entire stack, and uh, we're not afraid to break stuff. And that's it. <laughs> Better to break it on purpose than to have it break by accident. Uh, by the way, you should probably mention that uh, Rob is running a. I got. I have a stream going. So. Yeah, we've got. There's somebody hanging out in the channel. I don't know if they're local or. If that's... Please do it. <laughs> yes. Is that you don't block. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so that's, anyway. that's introduction. Uh, the first batch of slides I have are kind of an overview of what's out there, the current status, who's doing what. Um, then I figured we could talk about you know, setup and prerequisites. You know, with, without access to like a lab and stuff, you know, probably not going to dive too deeply into that. 
Um, I don't know what time lunch is. I just kind of threw it in there like, hey, sometime we're breaking for lunch. Uh, and then deep dive topics, we can uh, dive deeper into uh, whatever we want. Potential topics, things that we could talk about. Uh, <coughs> improving documentation. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Yay, documentation. Um, sucks. Uh, <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah, uh, it definitely sucks for the Chef Ross and Stark stuff. Um, just in general. But but just in general, you know, nobody likes documentation. But uh, I actually think that uh, and Gentle and their team have been doing you know yep. increasingly better and better work. And having looked at a lot of other open source projects, documentation is better. <laughs> so the bar is low, and they they hopped over. Um, <laughs> Other things we can talk about, uh, Test Kitchen, using Test Kitchen with OpenStack. Uh, test Kitchen is a test framework from Pops Code. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is ostensibly for testing chef cookbooks, but it can be used to test anything. Uh, it currently uses, it has two drivers. One is for Vagrant and one is for OpenStack. Uh, with OpenStack, you can use it to, um, what it does is you, you have your cookbook and you say, I want to run these sorts of tests on it. You know, Runs food critic in the land, uh, but then you can run chef spec and um, drawing blanks on names here, uh, cucumber and like four or five other uh, cookbook tests uh, that actually will create a VM, run run the install the cookbook and run whatever tests you have on them to make sure that it's behaving. You use it with Vagrant or OpenStack, and you can have you know, hey, we're going to test this on Ubuntu 1004, 1204. You know, Red Hat 5 and 6 and Windows 2003 you know, R2 and 2008 R1 and you know, whatever. Um, you can do that with the test kitchen. And the OpenStack driver is pretty good. I got a big patch set that's about to go in to add like a whole bunch more capability. We could hack on that. You know, we could, uh, if anybody is uh, savvy, well, we also would probably need an OpenStack. Cluster to test against. <laughs> I keep looking at your laptop. They're, they're running. Data center over there. Um, we, uh, one of the things that needs to be added is uh, running things. Right now, things run serially, uh, but with OpenStack, we should be running in parallel. You know, because that way, instead of, you know, because right now with Vagrant, it's like test a VM, tear it up, take it back down, test the next VM, next OS, next OS. So it can be kind of slow, but there's no reason we should do that with OpenStack. You know, OpenStack, we should be like, you know, test 10 OSs at the same time, free of damage. That would be pretty nice. Uh, that is a potential topic. People should check this out for that. Uh, Swift. I did not have cookbooks for Swift. No one has asked for them. I've worked with Dreamhost. They've got Seth. They don't want Swift. I've worked with AT&T. They don't want Swift. I've worked with uh, HP. They have their own stuff. I worked with Rackspace. They were telling people to use cloud files for the longest time. You know, they now have Swift cookbooks, and they've been working with Andy on those. Uh, they hacked mine around the book. Okay, so yeah, I saw, I saw patches. I saw your name on patches, so I was like, Andy's working. They they forked the the Swift repo, and uh, well, we we worked with them way way back, actually. Yeah, nothing's changed. Yeah, I mean, uh, your last commit was in December. Uh, on that on the branch, they yeah. they switched from. We've been adding features and uh, so some. A lot, a lot of the changes there are inspired by me, but not coded okay. by me. So no <laughs> we're going to need to tell it. And so I have yet to write some cookbooks. Um, yeah. I've read other people. Samsung would be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Against my advice. <laughs> what do they can use? Nothing. They don't do. They don't do object storage. Okay. I mean, that's you know, I'm I'm currently. Uh, in the middle of a big professional services contract with AT&T, and they have 15 data centers, and they don't want Swift in any of them. So I don't know where their data is going, but it's not going into Swift. Um, <coughs> I, thought, I thought Josh said Cassandra, but yeah, I, I, or you know, maybe or Hadoop. Maybe. I can pull up. Yeah, you know, we can go Those look at their code. They there are no cookbooks for Cassandra. There are no cookbooks for Hadoop from the OpenStack side. You know, they have. Literally 90 cookbooks um, that they have for their. What, what, what ATT is doing is uh, uh, they have 10 to 15 data centers and they're working on making it so they can install everything in the data center from scratch. So they put in a Bastion node, 
with a uh, cobbler and uh, boot everything up, install networking, you know, software for networking, and set up each one. The nice thing about, nice thing, terrible thing about each data center is it's all different hardware. No consistency between what's going to be running. So some of them have Rista gear, some of them have Cisco, some of them have Juniper. Um, and so they are working on being able to deploy a data center from scratch in each one. Um, so the cookbooks uh, are all open source. Uh, they have all of them up on GitHub. I got a slide about it later. But up on ATP Bob. Um, I'm helping them out. And I'll, I'll tweet a link to the interview with Josh that, that he did. From, uh, last month's mm -hmm. OpenStack. Yeah. So and back in Austin, uh, last month we had an OpenStack meetup and I presented with Josh. Uh, yeah, you're right. Josh I can go right to the YouTube then. Uh, about ATT's efforts. So, so this is a you know, NDA type stuff. Um, you know what SwiftStack is putting up? What SwiftStack is using? To, to be I tried to talk to John Dickinson last week at Open. They were there and I just never got around to talking to him. Yeah, he and Joe Arnold were there. I don't know what they, used. you know. Um, so I know um, there's uh, actually a Boston company that I know the the guy who used to be to be the VP of engineering, a uh, company called Sonian. Yeah. They do. Uh, they're very heavy user of both Swift and Amazon. And Chef. Yeah. So they run <laughs> a yeah. lot of Chef. Yep. They're. Yep. Um, Cheswick, I forget his name, Dave, no, David. He's, uh, I think he's speaking at the next uh, Chef Boston thing. Uh, in any case, they have their own set of Swift recipes. Okay. That, uh, weird, aren't they all? I, it's kind of weird. They're actually running Swift on the cloud. Uh, they, so they run on multiple public clouds, not just Amazon. And one of the issues they had is some of the clouds they needed to run on didn't have a pocket store. Um, I think it was the IBM cloud, I forget. So it's somewhat stale information. Um, so basically, they build cookbooks that are, um, they take, make, take a few choices that are different than the, the crowbar Swift yeah. cookbook. Um, I don't know, uh, you guys mentioned that you're interested in Swift. So don't build, if you're going to go deploy it with Chef and you're going to roll your own, and look around because there's recipes. Yeah, for there, there's definitely there's definitely Swift cookbooks out there. I just haven't helped anyone deploy mm -hmm. myself, um, which means I don't usually roll them into Chef Robin Stack unless somebody says, <coughs> "Here's a full set you know, that works." Yeah, just, Fair enough. Uh, Rackspace or you know, Dell or probably a place another full set. Yeah, we have Swift deployed in the basic here. Mm -hmm. uh, you did it from scratch, right? Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. We talked a little about before you about your employment and interest in all the stuff. So, yeah, it could be a good topic. Um, you don't have quantum up there. Uh, yeah, I can put quantum up Actually, there. Yeah, there were a couple of other things I was, I was yeah. going to suggest as possible. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely uh, open for suggestions. This is just things that I've brainstormed on. Yeah. The pull from source stuff is really interesting for us. Um, and so we can talk about pull from source if you want. Pull from source scares me, um, just because like as soon as you start. Can't let it. Can't let it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the future. The problem is, is like uh, I'm chef for open stack, right? And so I work with people who have much bigger teams than me. Like you, know, you guys have ten. Rackspace has ten. AT and T has ten. And I try to merge code from. Yeah, you know, Dreamhost has ten. And you know, and then smaller. Teams are like, oh, here's a couple patches. Or Deutsche Telekom, like, I don't know how many they have, but here's a big, you know, patch set. So it's like, pulling from source means instead of you know knowing, hey, I'm working on Grizzly, it's like, hey, I'm working on some indeterminate point of time that <coughs> not necessarily. Can. You can peg it. Yeah. Right? Well, you that's what right now I'm pegging it to, to releases. So, <laughs> so <laughs> does uh, do people know what's pulled from source? We can we can talk about it. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, pull from source is instead of taking packages from Ubuntu or Red Hat, we're going to pull from a tag point in time and build you know, build our own packages. Direct Python. Yeah. So one of I thought AT and the uh, Dreamhost is going to do it. Dreamhost is going to do it. Dreamhost has been radio silent for six weeks. Like they're oh. sort of trying to get out of beta. 
and like nobody I guess busy. Dream was responding to any email. <laughs> it's like somebody told them, you know, get to work. So they're so trying can to I have Jeff? You're thinking for a second and kind of you could put in open source and I don't like it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm I'm excited about pull from source. It just scares me as as a maintainer of like I'm trying to like put together a set of cookbooks where I can go to someone say someone smaller like you know a HubSpot where it's like you know two or three engineers have to maintain it and they have to be able to deploy it. Stable. But it, yeah, but yeah. So but the you reason can, it's you important. Wait, sure, sure. The reason it's important for us as a community is because if we get that, we can actually add it to Gate. Mm -hmm. So we can actually so pull from source. The idea is instead of having uh, Red Hat or Canonical or CISO, whoever, go and wait for a release of OpenStack to complete, pull the bits, go build packages and bless them. The idea is to short circuit that cycle. So basically, go to the OpenStack source code repository, like like the Chef deployment resource, right? It's like any other application. You go get the source. You go figure out its dependencies, which are tracked with the source, and you go install your OpenStack deployment from source. And there's a couple of really important reasons to do that. One reason is, so it's not, before I go to the reasons, it's not that the packagers are going to uh, lose their role. Because, for example, uh, there's a Red Hat dude, a Mark, who's doing a great job backporting things into stable releases. And that's what distributions are really good at, is like maintaining a stable release and not letting it freeze and, and become obsolete, but backporting patches to it. So there's a team, uh, I think Mark, I forget, cannot pronounce his last name, who's being very diligent about looking at fixes that are going into Grizzly or Paulson for a long time and backporting into the previous release of OS. So package. Distributors and packagers have their very important role. But for us as a, as a community, if we do have um, a community of operators of OpenStack and deployers of OpenStack, if we do have a set of agreed upon of stable shared cookbooks that can pull from source, we can actually go to uh, Monty, who runs the continuous integration team, and say, Put this as part of gate. Mm -hmm. If you introduce a breaking change, a change into OpenStack code that breaks deployments, well, either fix the deployment recipes or don't let it change in. Right. Yeah. right? So, so but you can't do that if you go through the whole cycle of, of, no, I, of packages. I, I so would you so, want to start with full from source working off you know kind of full from stable? No, no, right. Well we have we have it for Folsom right now. So no, no. Well, but, the reason but, 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 no, but the reason but no, we we skip to Grizzly. We want the to be working in Grizzly for Folsom is because of the stable <coughs> release policy, right? Nothing new will go into Folsom that will break yeah. existing stuff. That's the policy. Right. It's not. It's not going to allow, be allowed in. So the biggest value we're going to have is if we, starting with Grizzly two, that's just what a couple weeks old now. Starting with that, targeting it. And starting to get towards the point where we can gate releases. Right, right. I'm just saying for me, like, I would, the, the baby steps for me would be to short circuit using my repos and build up my own packages. You know, starting with, you know, Folsom, you know, Folsom stable, build up that branch, take out all the app code and use, you know, build from source. And then, if someone is feeling there and they start saying, well, I'm going to try to get you. We, you know, well, we, I think we, we talked about that. that. Yeah, we, like, I, like, I have to admit, for me, because, you know, hey, I'm running on Windows, right? I need to, I need Great. to package my, yeah, it's awesome, awesome package management. <laughs> the only, the only benefit I get out of, out of having an MSI is it's, it makes it, you know, quick, 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 next and easy. And we can't do a lot of the, you know, pre-chef puppet stuff for you, right? Uh, however, uh, if you pull from source, then now we can continuously update that source. Oh, yeah. and take no, I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm, I'm, I totally so, agree with the need for it. And, and, and I want to short circuit out. I, you know, I want to get rid of. Wait, but you know, before we. Can, can I, I, I want to throw one more thing. I just see hacking this agenda. So, yeah, okay. this a little. I, as long as we get permission. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm asking for permission to hijack your agenda for a couple of minutes more. <laughs> and ignoring you saying no. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So we talked, uh, we talked about one of the benefits of pull from source, which is for us as a community is using yeah. it. But for users, and I think that that's why you guys build a deployed resource, right? 
if I'm maintaining any applications, what I want to do, my ideal deploy cycle is hack the net QA, whatever, do whatever, then push it into my production Git server <coughs> and have all my whatever, let's assume it's a web app, have all my uh, little minions go and pull the latest source, deploy it, and run. Right? And as DevOps people that we have in the room, the users and practitioners of DevOps, that's how you want to deploy your application, right? So the idea is, to, to me at least, is that you don't do forklift updates, right? You don't go and sit in a room, have your developers sit in a room, hack on your applications for six months, and then push that after six months into production, and God only knows what's going to happen, right? But you want to have some, some level of continuous deployment where you take bite-sized migrations, bite-sized code changes, bite-sized things, and you push them into production. Yeah, and if, you're, so, if your infrastructure accommodates, that, that, accommodates yeah. that from the beginning, and this is the thing, if you walk in and say, this is part of our plan, yeah. right? Because right now, people are going in and trying to think about this after the fact, and that's no. You have to go in saying, hey, day one, this is what we're going to do. And we're going we're gonna to grind our teeth and take that pain. But which is which is so, why which is why we're building it into yeah. the infrastructure. That's right. But, so I think it's also it's a hard sell to the operations side of house too because they're just that used. Not if you're DevOps, right? Well, yeah. Not if you were, and if you look at <laughs> if you look at the context of OpenStack, where every six months you have a release. If you compare Folsom to Grizzly, and you look at the like massive amount of changes, oh, right? I know. It's right? Massive. It's like day one deploy Keystone from Grizzly using the Folsom recipes. Poof. Why? Because somebody very friendly who's not in the room, every time I see him, I move. Change the default uh, of, I mean, instead of using UUID uh, tokens for Keystone, they now use PKI based. And poof. Because yeah. there's new dependencies, there's a couple of new config directives. So as a dev, like, you want to tackle those changes as an operator? As, as a, as a it's but one we're, by one. we're shielding we're shielding the developers from the consequences of the operational the operational consequences by saying oh wait until it's packaged all the way at the end and then all these changes are accumulated and we're trying to get a, there's two you know, we're trying to get around that but we're also trying to make it so if quantum needs a change that's in the latest you know, Nova or Cinder you know all these things are inter interconnected so you don't have to wait for it to go through a package if you're going to try and take advantage of a feature that's now committed or even better, one that's in a branch that you want to see if it's actually going to work. I mean, I, 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 I'm, there's, there's, I'm on board. I just don't want to tackle it all by myself. I think we're playing some <laughs> And we're not going to ask. That's that. We wouldn't ask that. I just came from DevOps days, actually, in New York. And the thing is, um, for the, the real conflict in traditional ops and DevOps is making traditional ops comfortable. It's, 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 <laughs> you have to you've make them comfortable before you start ruining their world. Damn. Um, <laughs> really? First, so, you know, whatever you can do to reduce pager calls at three o'clock in the morning is is the win. Is the win right there? It's a, if this crazy continued deployment can if this continued deployment can actually reduce your pager calls, then yeah, they're on board. Then, then they're on board hundred percent. But how do you do it? We also have to give them better monitoring. We have to give them more robust um, metrics and. What's, what's cool about, failbacks and well, what's cool about what we can do with, with tools like Chef is that when we integrate with um, vertical bars, if you look at a, a graph and you know your system's performing, whatever you put vertical bars for every release or every every change in the code, and if you can give them a tool that when they click on the release, they can see exactly what changed. There's a comfort that's that's there. So yeah, just saying, no more packages. We're deploying from source. You know. Good luck, you know. <laughs> but like, oh look, we can potentially reduce feature calls. You know. yeah. so, was that so showing up their dashboard? You said the the chef bar. Oh, there. everybody's doing it now. Okay. Etsy is just, you know, Oswald was there. Yeah. Like, um, a bunch of Etsy guys were there, but a lot of folks are doing it. Um, I've heard some great talks from people as posts. Yeah. I'm curious how this whole discussion resonates with users, you guys, you guys. We actually have a need for both, so uh, we like to deploy stuff that's stable, but at the same time, like for instance, this week, literally today, uh, we want to get the bare metal driver out in like pseudo production, and it literally got packaged like this week. So we would have loved to have already pulled the source and, yeah. and gotten that out. And, and I have, I mean, people say they're do, like DreamOps has been doing backports and building packages, or you know, just specifically. It's just. 
it intimidates me because I, I have a very tiny lab and like <laughs> yeah. I'm merging, you know, four or five way merges here trying to like follow. I don't even follow the open stack mail list anymore. I just follow other people's Git repos. It, it satisfies yeah. another, another thing for, for us on the crowbar side because it's not operating system dependent then. No, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so one of the things that we don't get is, well, Fulsome's available on you know, SUSE and Ubuntu, but not on Red Hat, and therefore you can't, it's like, oh, come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And so we cut that, for community, we can cut that out. For supported stuff, I don't think we can. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm up for that. Okay. I just, I would not start on Trunk or Master. I would start on, like, help me build Fulsome stable with source, mm -hmm. and then, well, that's, they don't that's, want to get it on on top of CI. Like so, a couple, of, a lot of other people have like the whole Jenkins workflow going. I don't. You know. Part of part of the, I think part of it is that if you're in a greenfield situation, and you're like you know HubSpot, you were in a greenfield situation, right? You were building this new thing from scratch. You already had kind of a DevOps mentality in your organization. It's a relatively young organization. When I where I have the heartburn is in the larger companies where I come and say, okay, well, you know, OpenStack makes a lot of sense to do it here. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be totally redoing your entire operations uh, organization from top to bottom. And, and yeah, your your ops team, I can't tell them go install right. Grizzly. Now I'm going to say, go babysit this thing. You know, you're going to you guys are going to become OpenStack. Yeah, trunk follow. Well, so one um, of the things we did in in uh, Crowbar is we actually also include Tempest. So Tempest is the integration. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I so think the idea, I so the idea is running. you can you deploy the next. You pick a point you want to deploy to it from source. It could be between milestones, yeah. right? Instead of waiting six months, just wait uh, six weeks, right? So go to Grizzly One, deploy it, run Tempest on it, and you get a level of satisfaction of it's at least one. It's it's standing there, right? Mm -hmm. And th that's what you want to do, but right? So many shops just want to like stand it up and not yeah. look at it for another year. But there's, yeah. but there's a, but the, but pull from source does not <laughs> is no, not an anti case I, for I, that. I think if, if I do pull from source to stable branches to yeah. start with, we'll see who's happy. With but that. What, what I too. what I actually expect is people will, people will do pull from source for their own tag. Yeah. And they'll say, "This is my tag." And then, if they, you know, if they need to branch it, they can branch it. If they need to fix, they can be selective. I mean, all of a sudden, it gives you a huge amount of flexibility, which, once again, is a more sophisticated operator. Right. Um, and so, the, the one of the things that's interesting is if we can get to a case where one of the people offering support would actually support it if it was from a no no tag, because there's really no difference between that and their package. Yeah. But. Because that gives them more well, flexibility. I know, I, know, I know that Rackspace wants to <coughs> move off the districts. They want to, you know, Dreamos does. They want to move to Tron. We are. Yeah. You guys, everyone, all the all the big folks who are like very active and involved are, but the smaller players like me, you know, we, we still have a Diablo install and a closet. You know? right. And it just sits there and runs our VMs, and, you know, we run tests against it all day long because it's fine. It hits our use case perfectly. So what about the HP? I don't know what they're. I mean, well, they're very, very has gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, but they stood it up. They were selling it. So. They were not running Trump. So after after uh, Troy Tolman's talk at the last summit, you know that kind of like turned the table over on a lot of people because a lot of folks. Barry had the talk before Troy, and Barry's like, "We are going to have Grizzly on day one." And Troy was like, we had Grizzly last week, you know, and so that was kind of you know, a, a different story. And so I think, you know, people like Dreamhost and HP and Rackspace, everyone is going to move to Trunk, you know, or Trunk minus two weeks or, you know, stable Trunk, you know, cultivated Trunk, whatever. But the big players are going to go there, but smaller people are going to be like, you know, do we go with a distro? You know, like somebody like Piston or you know, um, Nebula, who are going to come on site and install it for you, and you're only going to call them when they have a problem. You know, you're you're not going to be like, hey, you know, it's Monday, I need my upgrade. You're going to be like, well, but those guys, you're not. Well, they're also they're, a lot of those are managed services, so you don't even care about what's going on in the package. Well, they're kind of walking the line between managed services and distros. You know, how often do you update your Red Hat? You know, how often do you update your you know, you can run a, you know, a if you want to. Yeah, you know, 
know, again, what I see pretty typically is a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Because people set it up, the, the sophisticated person sets it up, right. and then they turn it over to the, to the monkey. Ops guy. The, you know, the, 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 the monkeys on keyboards, and you know, they're, they're like, don't touch it. Yeah. I so, don't know what it does, but it works. <laughs> so we'll try to keep a happy space in between. So, so one more comment, talking about the whole CI and like smokestack and running this, running uh, Tempest. We have to start thinking about those pieces as part of your critical infrastructure. Oh, yeah. Right. So just like directory services, just like Kerberos, just like AD, just like you know whatever, we have to have those components there. The think of the benefit if each of us has that component, we can add additional gates that you know that code has to go through. Each being completely different from each other, right? right. So you says more test cases, all that stuff generated on. It. If you if you look at what's out there today and what these what the gates that exist actually are running on, they're not running on that much, right? Yeah. So you know it, it it will just make the quality of everything better, faster, right? If we if we have these, and it's just you know instant bug tracking, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, it matters. It matters because it'll impact the upstream our contributions back to upstream. So there. So you got um, <laughs> uh, So so Opscode has built um, continuous deployment tool chains for a couple of folks. Uh, you know where. You know, they had a major, large website outage, and you know, the CEO told the ops team they weren't allowed to touch code anymore. Um, and so we built this for a couple of people, and we're in the process of building out a, you know, James and Git and Chef and Garrett and, you know, uh, OpenStack or uh, Vagrant workflow. Uh, we we have all the cookbooks are out there. We're putting them together into like a package. To, you know, Product has them. Chef OpenStack will jump on that immediately. Like that's my goal is if I can get that CI tool chain working and documented so other people can put it in their data centers and pick you know which workflows they want to use, that would be pretty great. I'm not just two boxes in my lab right now one of them is right as motherboard. But I have SSD, so <laughs> but uh, if we get that CI tool chain working. Um, so yeah, built from source kind of negates the rel SUSE support question, I guess. It does and it doesn't because you're still operating system dependencies in the, but they surface faster. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, right now, the rel support in Rackspace is stuff. They, and you guys have SLES support. Is it, is it SLES and OpenSUSE or just SLES? Uh, they've been porting it to OpenSUSE, so. Um, so you don't have any RHEL stuff too, or you, you don't care? Uh, we there are there are people in the community who are working on RHEL pieces. We do care, yeah. uh, but it's not our active. I think there's uh, Adam Young and Rob Pickford are both local Estonians. Uh, and, yeah. and I think they're well. They have to, right? Because internally, I'm guessing they're not deploying a, a lot of districts. And, they might um, be using Fedora though. Yeah. Yeah, sure they do. But if the but are, but are they, they are they're probably working. My my question is are they using Crowbar or Chef or uh they're not no, using I think they're using their their own thing. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I meant. I didn't mean, you know, we need to make sure well OpenStack supports REL, we need to make sure that yeah. Chef supports REL supports us. I think I think the answer is Chef. Yeah, oh yeah, it definitely needs to. Definitely needs to, but uh, going to the packages would be easier than going to build from source. But build from source in the long run might have more value. Yeah. I think it depends on. I think those will be the only Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, OpenStack Commons versus OSOPS utils. You guys don't use OSOPS utils, do you? The the curvebar stuff. I don't think so. OSOPS utils is a library that Rackspace wrote. Uh, that handles a lot of search stuff and um, like searching by roles uh, to okay. find things to set up networks. So actually, that was the other item I wanted on this list was attribute injection. 
Which what? Attribute injection. Uh, Moving, which is which is less searchy. OpenStack Commons uses attribute injection, uh, and DreamHost and at t have moved to that. And, and we're we're, we're, we're going to follow that. I'm yeah. Uh, I'm going to move to OpenStack Commons, so I have all slide about that later. Good. But OSOPS Utils is what we use with Essex. OSOPS uh, OpenStack Commons is what we will use in also. That's right, because the OSOPS Utils was part of was part of the legacy of the collaboration. Because we our Crowbar One uses search extensively. Yeah. So what's the deal with search? Speaking of, I was we, just you just about about Commons we're coming back to it. Okay, sorry. So OpenStack <laughs> Commons uses uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, JPipes and, yeah. and John Finley wrote it to replace OSOPS Utils because OSOPS Utils was very obtuse software and OpenStack Commons is actually very well documented. Um, so, uh, we can is there, who's repo is it on? AT&T. Uh, OpenStack Commons? Yeah, okay. ATT Cloud.
Fair enough. And, you know, the people out there will be on SPN eventually, you know, probably before that. But so, so that's that's OpenStack Commons versus those such utils. We can dive into cleaning up the network stack. That's, yeah, that would definitely be a good topic to, you know, flesh out. Uh, Knife Open Stack. Um, I've got a whole, like, six or seven slides on Knife Open Stack. If you want to deploy stuff on top of Open Stack, switch to Chef, Knife Open Stack is what you use. Uh, there are, like, three or four bugs. We have a couple things that it doesn't currently support. You can work on making sure that's well rounded. I think I've got, you know, four or five patches, we could do a walk through the code if you care. You know, if you don't care about setting up OpenStack, you just want to run stuff on top of it, that OpenStack is what you want. Um, and it works with, like, Diablo and Up, and everyone has told me that it works. Like, Piston checked off on it, Nebula checked off on it. Uh, I assume Perverse you guys, you know, yeah. people are using it. DreamWorks uses it. Instead of, like, having a DreamWorks plugin, they're using that OpenStack. Um, so it's pretty good. There, there's a few things it's lacking. So we should definitely, oh, sorry, definitely fix that. Uh, OpenStack syslog monitoring. One of the things I do in my in the Chef OpenStack cookbooks is I remove all the monitoring and logging stuff that everyone else has because surprise, surprise, everyone has an opinion on how that should work, and every single one of you has a different opinion. And so I try to keep it out of Chef OpenStack. Because you know, maybe you don't like collect feed. Maybe you don't use syslog. Maybe you use you know, uh, maybe you hired you know, Jordan Syslog to be your um, you know your blog guy, and so you're not going to use syslog. Uh, so I've just been yanking all that code out. There's no logging and no monitoring in the Chef OpenStack cookbooks because every one of you is doing it different. So how do you? I don't. You don't, but if we want to consume. Consume those recipes and use them. Yes. How would we layer in? I would say write a you know, a OpenStack syslog cookbook or an OpenStack you know Nagios cookbook that you know uh, depends on the note. Well, it, it problem is that you would need to, for example, tweak uh, whatever the base thinning or whatever I forget base thinning whatever wherever you configure, for example, the various OpenStack components. You'll need to tweak their configuration to send syslog to the right place. Yeah. Well, you don't want two recipes when you play in the same files. Are those typically? Chef Eleven solves that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, are they typically monitored by the same files? Yeah. Yeah, I guess for the logging stuff, at least in Swift, yeah, you got to choose which syslog. Um, well, you can use which, which local zero, local one. Usually, you split it up. Um, okay. Like I would split up the the object store and the proxy and stuff into different syslog channels. Right. And pull up that. So that's in the same, you know, Etsy Swift proxy dot com. Etsy Swift, Swift. Both of them are running in the same template. So putting in a stub <laughs> that you know could be extended. Yeah, you might want to stub out like. That you know, a decent interface, and um, well, the Rackspace ones have um, they have a monitoring library, yeah, and they should be call it. So yeah. that will take they're care. They're just they're pushing collect the into every recipe. Yeah, but you can basically there's a monitoring cookbook that defines the monitor. What does it mean to monitor thing? Yeah. And all the other cookbooks they effectively call a, a provider. A right, resource. Yeah, that, that's that what they're doing. Puts it in. But that, that won't, they, solve, won't solve the same group of file issue. Right. right. I, I, I wanted to at least pull the monitoring section out into a separate recipe. They were putting the, mon the monitoring logic into every single recipe. Yeah, it's a lot over here. Yeah. And so, like, whenever I deploy, say, Nova API, there's a, a resource in there of monitoring Nova API. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why don't we just have a, you know, a Nova API recipe? You know, so that way I can pull that out if I'm not using your monitor. You know, say I want to use sensitive instead of not use. But it will be the same, just to replace the cookbook that provides. Sorry, one of the things I, I like about it, we do something very similar where when I deploy the resource, I also define how it should be monitored. Mm -hmm. right? So when I move the resource or deploy another instance or whatever, 
then if I deploy a Swift node, that's a storage node, then I want to publish in the same, in very close proximity, for example, here's the disk that this storage node uses. So the monitoring recipe doesn't need to know the insights of, of the resource and what it is. It just needs to say, I have this service running, it's listening on this port, and these disks better not fail. Yeah. Right? So then I can write the generic recipe that regardless of what's using those resources, it knows to monitor them. So if it's Swift or if it's a Hadoop, I don't care because it runs a service, it listens to a port and uses disks. And then I can just have a generic monitor these things are running. Right. Right? Um, yes, I agree. So I, I want to have monitoring recipes, and I don't care if they're inside the Nova cookbook. Right. I just don't want them in the same recipe. I'm trying to that, propose a, a, a separation that's slightly different from what you're describing, where inside Nova or inside the OpenStack cookbooks, you have a way of declaring what needs to be monitored. Not actually monitor it, just declare right. what it is that needs to be monitored. And then you can bring in your own recipes, so we currently use Nagios, that brings in the understanding of, okay. I need to monitor so these, go monitor it. So we have uh, there's a firewall. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a database code where you define like database schema, and it doesn't care what it is under the cover. Mm -hmm. And so you want to use that type mm -hmm. where you just say like monitoring, monitor this, and then back on the provider side, you'll say, oh, we're using Sensu, we're using exactly. you know, Xenos, we're using Xamarin. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Graphics kind of started taking that approach. Okay, I haven't looked at it lately. When I was in it, back when I started. In Started on it, they were very, very opinionated. Like, you're going to use syslog, and Dreamo said, no, we're not. And so I just like, you know, screw it, yeah. all this stuff out. No, fair enough. And, and so, yeah, that. What we need to have is is the, the heavyweight resource provider, like we have with database and firewall. Not necessarily, right? We can just have, as long as we have the API. Well, to the resource you're, provider, you're, you're, you'd find the API in the resource, and then you can have multiple separate uh, providers. cookbooks. Yeah, yeah providers, cookbooks, providers. whatever. Bring your own. Yep. Does that make sense? You know, you're sure. Okay. <coughs> yeah. No, I, I that when we when we started writing the first heavyweight providers like database and mm -hmm. firewall, we wanted to get to that. It's just so maybe that should be something outside of OpenStack. That's oh, yeah, yeah. Ideas. No, it, it's probably totally something that we. So, by the way, but I have stated my hidden, not so hidden agenda, which is I'm trying to focus on places where if we don't have a common API, we don't have a common agreement, we don't have with everybody using the cookbooks because they or forking them, right? We don't yeah. want people to fork everything. Um, so that's my agenda. To come no, up no, with, no. A, with a plan to have unified uh, cookbooks <coughs> that everybody can use and you may take. <laughs> yes. What I, what I want is to make sure that everyone doesn't diverge greatly. Mm -hmm. Just give me patches. I don't want to make them. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so we're, that is definitely a good topic. Desktop virtualization. Currently, all this stuff gets deployed on hardware. If you are like a Baker guy, I don't have any love for you. Uh, if you are a Fusion guy, I got nothing for you. If you do you want to deploy this on anything besides hardware? I got nothing. Does anybody care? It's working very nice. So we're using both um, VMware and VirtualBox and KVM. Because but is it documented? Documented. Yes, it's documented. Yeah. Well, for Crowbar specifically, we have instructions on uh, instructions and in code. Actually, uh, John here just finished a bunch of uh, vagrant stuff to deploy. Well, actually, no, that's a good development yeah. environment. Yeah, and I'm wondering somebody's working on what to build the ISO. The OpenStack build environment. Well, how much <coughs> could these recipes go into Chef Solo or like what's the typical OpenStack? I don't know. It, like you know somebody somebody always says, Can I test this stuff under Baker? And I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> why would yeah, you expect like, it not stuff. to huh? why why would you expect well, it not to work? Well think about Networking. it. Networking? But let's go back to, to what um, we were saying about uh, networking in VirtualBox um, is okay. 
That, you, that's you, the thing quantum maybe okay, not. Just, quantum I've maybe. never taken the time to sort it out and document it, so anyone besides me or you would use it. I can, I can tell you, it, it, VM, VMware Workstation does not support networking sufficiently to do this for real. It, uh, I think it strips VLAN. It behaves it's, badly it, with VLAN. It's, and and yeah. so it's, it'll actually, you, I mean, we do all, all the time a normal cloud deployment, but you can't connect it to the internet very well because of the VLAN tagging channel. Yeah. So, so I don't know if it's a big enough thing that people care Anybody about. in the room cares? Yes. Yeah. We just keep it on real hardware okay. because it's easy, I guess. Well, it's convenient. I mean, for testing, you want to do it. But yeah. Well, I, I test most of the smaller components, but once I hit the networking layer, I give up. And, give up. Yeah. and so I'm usually testing the networking layer. I, I, I think that it's, yeah. I mean, when you get to networking, basically, desktop virtualization sucks. And I, think, I can't see how it ever will not suck. It kind of. I don't know. Would virtual box have a file and KVM? Yeah, I've used virtual box. Yeah, I've used virtual box. But I was running, I was testing the other stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
then, uh, the tree root environment to build the Pixie infrastructure. So I, I have about, I, I basically have that, that'll build the Windows PE image, take all the, your drivers that you pre-supply, pump it into the PE image, and leave it there open. I haven't closed it yet. No doubt the Pixie piece we're going to have to move to the next. So they're all going to converge into one. Um, the Hyper-B only piece for OpenStack compute, like I said, requires Hyper-B already be there. So that could easily, here, which I think you're not bare metal provisioning your Linux either. So. Well, you are, but with that outside market. Right. So. I, I, I mean, I have I have a set of code for fixing that. No, no, I don't. TFT2 fixing. Yes. Yeah. But it sounds like. No, my stuff does all the same thing as that. It just does it for, it, it builds out the fixing environment for every single public Linux distribution. Yeah, at the same so time. Uh, so if I want to just get a Windows box ready. Vanilla, we'll put it this way. Ideally, my goal is to take the, so most of what we do, just to put it in logistics, right? It's all done via PowerShell. So all the Windows bits, uh, any of the hardcore configuration, it's, it's straight up PowerShell. You can easily take the PowerShell out and, and convert that because you have a native PowerShell provider, right? Which will probably make our life a hell of a lot easier. Um, and we have stuff like we're, we've already have full NVGRE deployments done with uh, PowerShell, um, just because we're getting ready to add that into Quantum as well. So um, ho I'm hoping by the end of this week, our, and, and once again, it's all on the sort of PowerShell and less Puppet, more PowerShell. So we can use that, you know, just use that as a piece. So. But what do I need to do to? Is there, I can, so, is there an easy way to get? You know, the 2008 R2. Yep, so you, what we, our development platform is Hyper-V Server. Okay, Hyper-V Server is free as in ESXi free. Okay, download it, you can you can use it. The only time they actually charge you is when you install it. And you know, that's just the, the Microsoft thing. But you can, you can download it for free, use it for free, that's what we all use. For free. And, and can I install that via Pixie? Yeah. Yeah, but you would have to already have done the part other. to make the Pixie. Right? Yeah, hopefully. Oh, so, so when you say the part to build the Pixie, you have to use the Windows tool chain to build the Pixie stuff. Yeah, or use, you know, there's other people that are trying to do it. Like I know the, uh, was it the Razor guys are, are doing some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm doing it just based on, literally, just, literally, <laughs> just pulling down the pieces and then telling Windows to build this for me. Um, and then the byproduct is going to be the files necessary, like the folder layout and the Windows PE image that you could then populate into your TFTP route. And ideal, what my puppet's already going to do is do all that population as well uh, between the two. Now, we don't, have, we don't have to go that whole route. Ideally, what we could start with is do the Hyper-V, just the open stack components of Hyper-V. Because that does all the node configuration, right? Like we have a lot of, you know, all the virtual networking gets configured, uh, you know, your time sources, your um, your whole Python environment, um, all the, uh, literally, all the, you know, they're not registry keys, but it's PowerShell to enable, you know, all the different features. Uh, so, you know, like uh, ISO Cinder volumes, ISO and stuff, you know. So it's just the service you know, definition. To yeah. A lot so of those parts. It's, uh -huh. it's getting the Hyper-V box, Hyper-V server box in place that I'm worried about. Yeah. So right now, this is in, in order, like, Alex, so Alexander Pauly is my, like, uh, you know, no record developer, right? Um, he uses Hyper-V on VMware, you know, on, on top, because you can do the, uh, the pass-through. And I, I refuse to do it, just because I'm going to make up, you know, we're going to do it on Hyper-V. So you can run multiple Hyper-Vs on top of, uh, you know, VMware. And, and basically, uh, once you do that, then you can, you can do the full stack. If anybody in here wants to help in any way, shape, or form with um, Hyper-V testing, uh, come see me and I'll <coughs> obliterate my Redmond colleagues with MSDN requests. Okay, so I'll give you a free, you can have your own MSDN registration. Uh, just send me an email, it might take a while because they don't like to move, you know, they move the speed of bureaucracy. So um, I'll, send I'll send you one. Weeks, but, yeah. I'll send you one to help get the grease, the, the wheels grease. Yes, is someone, Last week, told me that the licensing had changed on how you have in this game. Like, 
Previously, my understanding was Hyper-V was a great choice because running the Windows VMs on top of Hyper-V is cheaper than anything else. Yeah, there is, it is. So there's two ways, right? Now, it depends on which you, and, and this is this is my, this is Ricard, right? And this is my abridged knowledge of the whole thing. You have Hyper-V server, free, download it, run any open source operating system on it, or not. Okay. You want to run Windows on top of it, you license it at the VM. Windows Server Core with Hyper-V Role enabled. Okay, you license the server. All right, all your Windows VMs on top are basically free. Okay, but it's a different licensing model where you're paying, and so there's a monthly reoccurring, uh, you know, just like all the other big boys, there's a monthly reoccurring component for that if you're going to do it. And there's like data center level price. That's part of the, the data center level price. Now, you know, from the development standpoint, like we're literally just talking about using Hyper-V. We're doing everything with Hyper-V server in mind because that's the one that anybody can go download today and start using today. It's just there is, you have to realize that you have a PowerShell interface, but, you know, and that's it. There's no, there's no GUI. However, from a feature set, all our features are built into the hypervisor. So you actually have PowerShell access to the entire SDN stack. You have PowerShell access to everything. And they utilize today System Center to manage those. With OpenStack, we're just we're actually just hitting the WI interface directly, uh, you know, through the natively running Python code on that Hyper-V node. And and in the tape in the case of our configuration management, we're just using the, you know a lot of PowerShell to make the tweaks because it, it just makes it more you know, it's just easy. And it, and it's there now. It's actually the, the PowerShell interface is your bus. You can, you can do that. It's painful, but you know it, it works. And and so we could, if I, I I could go and install that on a box and enable WinRM. You, you know you could do actually if you had WinRM you could do full remote uh, management well, that's of that chef. without. That's how chef does. Yeah. So I, I was going to say so I can go download the free version. So from from your perspective, right? You would yeah you would need Hyper-V server or literally send me an email and I'll start the process of getting you a. Listen. I think we've got No, I'll get one for me. It'll hurt that more. <laughs> okay. So so we'll we'll do it. You know, you get that. You deploy a single node. And I actually, for debugging purposes, if, if you can get a full version, then you can install on core, which is you want to run it on core, that way you get used to using the command line. But you can install all the GUI tools. So if you have to run an MMC, you can. Which is nice at times to be able to interact with the VM. As well as that, uh, Alexandra Pelotti, uh, you know, Guys. They did a uh, PowerShell plugin for the X3 RDP uh, executable, so you can just go connect the VM and it'll connect up through the hypervisor uh, to the virtual machine. So you don't need, um, you know, any anything to actually access those virtual machines. You can do it natively on the box, but once again, you have to install that. Um, those bits there. Um, and yeah, you, you, that's pretty much. You would need that. You need to install the Chef client, and you're ready to go. Yeah. We can install the ship client via WinRM. Yeah. So if if you do that, so that that's yeah, it. There's nice windows. Yeah. And then you just it, from that point, your tool chain will take over. Like what I'm looking to do right now, which I've, we've already done on the Linux side, is basically you know do the pre-seed to a, a semi-minimal subset with just the tool set that we need. You know, followed by the configuration management coming, uh, getting sort of registered on the back end through post scripts. Yeah. And then and then once that comes up, that just takes off. So you can do the same thing, and we can reuse all the you know PowerShell and, and Kung Fu that's over there, rather than having to. You know. Okay, because there there are yeah you know, there are service providers who have talked to me and they are interested in this because you know ostensibly it's cheaper to run your Windows VMs. No. And, and just from a higher level for anybody that's interested, the current use case out of anybody, and I'm <laughs> right now. My current customers are CERN and the largest Windows desktop deployment, uh, probably in the financial, uh, financial world. And in each case, they're talking about a mixed usage scenario, Linux running on you know, Windows running on Hyper-V, yeah. all under a single control. Yeah, and that's what and, and specifically, you know, we're also trying to drive a single control plane for the network. Uh, right. At least I am. Okay. Well, that's, we can dive into that this afternoon if uh, there's more interest. Uh, we can talk to CI tool chains. You know, there are several examples out there. Uh, I, you know, we can all talk about how we need this. That's something we can dive into. We can start on build from source. You know, where, 
put in the shims, let's start doing. Uh, we can also pull up through quantum and networking and come up with a rational plan. I, I know I know I have to get off Nova networking, but I just can't quit it because it works. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, I do have a business need to write quantum. Um, Nasira is uh, paying off to write quantum. So, whew, a lot of topics, a lot of things we could talk about this afternoon. Let's talk about uh, current status. What's what's what? The uh, you know, five W's. Uh, who? Uh, these are the people who have uh, currently. Said that they are you know, publicly are saying they're involved. Um, you know, patches are coming from some of them. No patches are coming from others. Uh, you know, the why? Why are we even doing this? Um, you know, <coughs> this is uh, uh, deploying OpenStack is not supposed to be hard, but it is. Uh, <laughs> um, but so, it's, and, and Chef for OpenStack is a project, not a product. So if you call up. Ops code and say, hey, we want you to support OpenStack. We like, have you met Crackspace, Piston, Nebula? We are not that company. You know, I am not going to do that for you. Uh, if you say, hey, we don't want to talk to those guys. We want to do it ourselves, and we want some professional services help to make sure that Chef works in this use case. Then, then I might come. Somebody. Uh, unfortunately, for you guys, HTTP is blocking me back here. Uh, but it's a community. We have a mailing list and all that fun stuff. Um, the what? So there are chef repos. Uh, there's documentation. There are cookbooks and I focus stack. Everything I do gets open sourced. Um, and so it, it slowly trickles in. If you are leading edge, talk to the other people who have forks. They would be a lot faster than me. Um, it's kind of slow sometimes. Uh, there's all the uh, the wares, uh, yeah. The mailing list, not very active, um, but uh, IRC channel, a little more so. It gets logged um, on the communityopscript.com. We're logging. Uh, yeah, the GitHub repos, uh, the OpenStack Chef docs are going to move to get uh, opscode Chef docs. If you haven't seen docs.opsco.com, about six weeks ago, we published that uh, right after the developer summit. We have a professional doc writer. We lowered the bar to collaboration on docs. So if you don't have a CLA with Opsco, we don't care. We're, we're doing this one through GitHub. Docs all through GitHub. Um, I've already opened a few tickets. Pull requests are awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we take those quickly. Um, the uh, and so the OpenStack stuff is supposed to move over <coughs> to the official OpsCode docs. The problem, of course, is if I'm tracking truck, I'm always going to be writing documentation. But you know, maybe maybe that's worth it. Um, the cookbooks uh, are getting tagged each time I release a new set. I tag them. Uh, the Essex ones are 2012.1.1 because I actually did a point release on them. Uh, added a few more little features. Uh, Night Open Stack is on GitHub. If you need to open tickets for any of these things, they are all under ticketsopscode.com. Uh, the Knife projects all got consolidated, so there's no longer Knife Open Stack. It's open a Knife ticket, and your subcomponent is Open Stack. Well, so Open Stack Chef Repo only seems to have environments and roles, or am I missing something? You have to use librarian. Yeah. Oh, you have to use librarian. librarian. Um, I'm going to switch to Berkshell, or I haven't I'm used going to support either, so. Berkshell also. I don't really. I wanted to just use Spice Repo to see how it worked out, but I needed to support Git repos because things are moving too quickly to go to the community site. Librarian and Berkshell both support the community site. The Chef community right now seems to be leaning towards Berkshell. I like librarian better, but. You know, it, they're very, very similar. Um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, Librarian and Bookshelf are both cookbook managers that, rather than use Git submodules, uh, you maintain a file. Uh, for a Librarian, it is a chef file for Birch. It's Birch. like Ruby Gems for chef, kind of. Uh, 
it's more bundling. Of a bundling. Yeah. yeah. So it, it understands pulling things from the Opsco community site. So I can say, hey, I need NTP 1.2. And it goes to communityopsco.com, downloads it, installs it. Um, or I say, here is the SHA from GitHub that I want. You know, so if I'm pulling a straight up Git SHA or a tag or something on the GitHub, it understands that. Both, both of them understand that. Librarian wants to manage your cookbooks directory. Workshop doesn't want you to have a cookbooks directory. <laughs> There's nothing in cookbooks at all. It manages everything through the works file. And it talks directly to your chef server and pushes your cookbooks for you. Mm. So not a good pattern for solo. Both are terrible for solo. Yes. Um, why, why is librarian terrible for solo? Oh, OK. Maybe librarian's not. Uh, if they have a cookbook, you just need a cookbook. They both count on network connectivity and talking to the Chef community site. Berkshelf actually validates against the, the server. Right. So it, it checks, it asks the Chef server, what do you have? Right. And, and so uh, if you're looking to talk to the Chef server uh, via libraries, um, Berkshelf is written by Riot Games, you know, they very huge Chef Shop. Um, they have a Ruby library called Ridley. Um, they have Spice and then Ridley. They both talk to, they're both Ruby libraries for talking to the Chef server. Uh, slightly different takes on how they want to do it. Um, yeah, but Workshelf is chatty. Appears uh, to be faster and definitely uh, more people are working on it. Um, and so I will probably. But is there, it sounds if you have a slightly different use case, right? Because if I'm, if I'm wanting to hack on the cookbooks, I need a local copy somehow. Yeah, Ber Berkshelf and Librarian will both let you use a local repo too. Still in your Berks file, you just say, here's the path. Say, I'm using, I'm using Glance from mm -hmm. Pat. And don't even use Git. Oh, yeah. So they, they support community site, Git, and local. Uh, true, but if I understood correctly, workshop, I haven't played with it so long. No, I'm it's, okay. I'm questions. it's a good way of pulling from a repo and sticking into Chef server, but yes. not, for example, downloading the Chef open stack recipes. As no, a it box. does that too. It, does, it, it stores them. It stores them in your home directory and works. So uh, next time you say, hey, I need this, this, and this for some other there. project, it's like, oh, I got all those on my Burke shelf. <laughs> On my bookshelf, so it stores all every cookbook you ever use. It stores them for you. Okay. So, which is why versioning becomes important. Don't reuse version numbers, you know, or don't reuse kid shots. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a little harder. That, to that's much harder. Um, but but uh, yeah. So both librarian bookshelf support you know community site, get repos, and local file systems. Um, Workshelf's faster. It's a lot faster. And, uh, you know, I miss having stuff in my cookbooks directory <coughs> myself when I use Workshelf, but whatever. Uh, lean into it. That's cool. Kids seem to like Workshelf these days. Uh, and there's a Twitter handle. Shout out the stack. What do you, um, I'm, I've made myself responsible for the for our IRC logs. You guys have the nicest IRC logs manager. And somebody it's sent us a better one. Because um, I hate the one I have. I don't know what it is, but talk to, uh, uh, what's Noah's handle in IRC? It's only the one that okay, you, you know, uh, can pop on and ask somebody. You, you know, uh, <laughs> you know uh, Cantor on, on Twitter? K A N T R N. That's the one you see. Uh, or on IRC, it's it's code code lawyer. It's not code lawyer. He's in our IRC channel. It's Noah Noah Cantor. He okay. he said he runs all the community site stuff. So he handles the IRC okay. logger. I think it's an open source project. And somebody the other day sent us like an email saying you guys should use this, and it was like. Some really slick looking thing. It's probably some Python thing. I was huge into Python. 
but I really should be friends. He writes, I should have friends. Uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, all that stuff's logged, mail list, get repos. Um, I'm slowly switching over to Bermuda. Uh, Win, what's up there today? Um, the everything on 2012.1.1 tag is Essex. Uh, I have dropped the branches because um, nobody seemed to care about maintaining previous branches, you know, for now. Uh, but the tags are there, so we can rebranch off them later. So I'm working on Fulsum. I haven't published that stuff yet because I haven't been in my office to test lately, uh, which is why I probably need to start publishing this. Um, operating systems, it's currently Ubuntu 12.04 only. Uh, there's lots of code in there that has if, both if, Fedora, if, Debian, you know, but uh, having not tested. Uh, hypervisors, you can use KVM or Alex C. Uh, so wait, why, um, again, my agenda, switching over to these. Yes. Why, how would we, what would be a path of taking, so we support, for some things, uh, only Ubuntu. Uh, oh, sorry, Ubuntu and SUSE. And for some things, Ubuntu, SUSE, and Red Hat. Um, How would we get to all support of everything? Yeah. So Start at the base. I, sorry? Start at the base role. Make sure that everything in there works on your platform no. of choice. I mean, literally, this is, this is how I, I move things forward. I take the all in one role, and I start with. The, the first thing has the base role. Base role has like 10 recipes that it installs. Those are all from ops code. Those all work. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to set up CI that tests all of them on every poll. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah, I, the goal is, yeah, the, but it's baby steps. And it so, but that, that brings up a question of well, if we do a test that shows that those changes don't work, you, do you not take the poll? How do you well, want to do, do take that? Poll. I mean, we have we, we are now at like zero day on cookbook requests. Like Josh Timmerman has gone nuts and he he was number like fifty three on GitHub last year. Like the yeah, whole, I whole saw GitHub. That. I saw <laughs> you know. And he our our like pulls to be processed for cookbook tickets is like under ten. No, I think Rob was asking how do we guarantee quality of the cookbooks? You're talking we're, about speed. We're doing test kitchen. So all the test we all the cookbooks now have tests built into them. No, no, so the scenario oh, Rob was describing it. was if we I guess you're describing something like uh, Garrett non voting so non blocking votes on Garrett where yeah. if we need to have take your cookbooks and we run it in our environment mm -hmm. and it's potentially slightly different. And somebody pulls, submits a poll that breaks in our environment. Breaks Red Hat. Might work on SUSE and Ubuntu. Correct. So we wouldn't want you to accept the pull because something is going to be broken. Right? And I guess you're asking how would the process work? Yeah. I mean, uh, how are you, are you going to, I mean, one of the things I know we're moving towards with OpenStack is multiple builders contributing into Garrett right. long term. Like and, and actually giving your opinions about whether a poll was a poll. Yeah, good. there's a couple, right? There's Smokestack, there's the Ubuntu QA guys, the Ubuntu server guys do it. So you basically go look at their pull requests um, and get it, whatever, review that open site or you can see, oh okay, yeah, this poll worked on, it worked on their stack, that's a, pre that's a must. Here's the review comments and here's what Smokestack thinks about it and here's what um, whatever the Ubuntu builder thinks right. about it. I think they, there was some back and forth around doing the voting or not. And basically it's it's still a human choice of saying accept or not. <laughs> I don't recall any pull request being accepted with a vote that said it broke in one of the environments. So the dev stack vote is mandatory. It, Garrett won't merge a pull request sure. if it doesn't pass smoke uh, dev stack. But the other ones are basically non-blocking votes. Right. And I guess what, Rob what are we doing for cookbooks? How, exactly. If we want to promote so, multiple environments. So, so for the cookbooks, uh, if the cookbook in the metadata says supports OS, the ones that ops code definitely supports. 
Ubuntu LTS, you know, 10.04 and 12.04. Uh, Red Hat 5 and 6, you know, of course, whatever. Um, Windows uh, 2003 R2 and later. Um, that's it. Debian is so kind it's of about, on the it's edge. about whatever the We do not is, have so. SLES. We do not officially support SLES. We get well, best let's effort on Solaris. And so what you say in the cookbooks is in the metadata, if you say it supports this, and if there are tests, that test those platforms. So in, in, in your kitchen file, you can say L, you know, Ubuntu, LTS, 10.04, 12.04, 32-bit, 64-bit, and it will run through all those tests. And if those tests fail, you know, we're not going to, you know, Joshua will not take the patch and not merge it to, to release, but it can sit in another Git repo. It can sit in a fork <coughs> in a branch. And using Berk Shelf or whatever you guys use, you know, I can pull off a branch and use that until it gets fixed. Until it merges to, you know, ops code is official. But we well, definitely but want. So, a couple of questions. So, you're talking about the official ops code site. Is OpenStack going to move there? Or you it, might is have there. Mentioned? it is there, oh, but right. it is in a very gray area on officially supported because it's a whole lot of effort just to test that. Right. Okay. And so I'm trying to build I you know my my goal is to get you know Folsom open stable and then put that on top of start public you know start deploying to a, a chef build CI environment and document that process so other people can go and build their CI environments using the same cookbooks. And it will be you know, chef, you know, and chef on top of OpenStack testing OpenStack. So it will be, you know, turtles everywhere. Um, but it'll all be documented. That's the goal. And who knows what comes out of that. But, yeah, the OpenStack ones, you can open tickets against them, and we've taken pull requests for them. You know, somebody objected to the fact that they were all upgrades. You know, all the packages said upgrades, and that was a Rackspace thing. And I was always on my annoyances list and somebody we merge that to switch it to install. You know. um, that should probably be upgrade. <laughs> you know, you can, you it can, should be configurable. Uh, so I'm looking at the. It, it, so if you open a cookbook ticket, I think the OpenStack packages are listed as sub components. So okay. you can open tickets, but okay. they will be slow. People have sent pull requests, and I've merged some of those. So the chef file from OpenStack chef repo. I, I'm I ran to yeah, yeah. to get so the, to actually the, code. The chef file in the OpenStack chef repo is the librarian file, and so it points to Matt Ray. Huh? It points to Matt. Pulls stuff from Matt Ray. It does. It pulls it right up a GitHub because I'm using the sys control cookbook from mm -hmm. somebody else that is not the one on the community side, and I have. <clears throat> I put it in my repo because I didn't know that other person, and if they just pulled it off, I didn't want to screw. I guess it's leading to a question. How do we, back to the multi-OS, um, if OpenStack stuff depends on cookbooks that are part of fully supported cookbooks, like MySQL and yeah. or whatever system, and they're not like SUSE compatible, for example. We're, I mean, we, SUSE has been giving us a lot of patches, and we've been merging. Yeah, we've been so, working I mean, with it's, it's not like, we're not going to say no. If you're not breaking anything, we're going to take your patches. I mean, you know, we've got patches for like crazy crap. You know, we've got like Raspberry Pi support. Like, no, on a well, lot of stuff. Really out front. <laughs> no, no, oh, I have one with me. Yeah, I mean, I literally. <laughs> we, we merged Raspberry Pi support into OHI. We have, you know, Omni OS and you know, you know, FreeBSD and NetBSD and OpenBSD and you know, Windows and fucking sorry, um, <laughs> you know, Reactos. I mean, who uses Reactos? You know, that guy. He's got Chef support. You know? <laughs> so it's like we're not going to say no to pull requests, especially SUSE. I mean, we are definitely we don't see a lot of SUSE, but when we do, those people have like twelve hundred boxes. You know, it's, there's nobody with like. You know, five SUSE boxes, they all have 12 boxes. And, you know, that's just, so So we're definitely, you know, SUSE is, is on the, like, on par with Solaris. You know, we support Solaris, but, you know, we don't, yeah. We support Solaris, and, you know, 
we don't support some stuff. Like if you would say, hey, will you take this back? Of course we're gonna take it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So as good as we can, we're going to try to keep moving it all forward. You know, it's uh, as long as it doesn't break stuff, I'm gonna take the back. Yes. Yes. You guys spent a lot of time talking about some of the challenges with I'd like to be curious, is there a consensus view on what would make multi stack, more pervasive, or more ubiquitous? So, as someone who's studied the history of Red Hat, there's all the time space in multi stack, but generally speaking, it seems like there's a little bit of joy in that's happening, but there's a problem to bring up that it's hard to frustrate and requires everybody to. So, I, I think long term, I think the future for most people will be distros. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of, I, like when I say distros, I don't mean Canon, I don't mean Ubuntu and Red Hat, I mean like a Piston or a Nebula or a Rackspace or, you know, a Crowbar, you know, someone who's going to hold your hand and take your support calls. The people using Chef for OpenStack are kind of like the Gen 2 guys, like nobody's gonna support those guys, <laughs> but, but you know who's running Gen 2? Like stock exchanges. You know, I mean, there are people like you know, uh -huh. Mercantile Exchange runs Gen 2 because they can build the exact same thing mm -hmm. any point in time. You yeah. know, they can go back and rebuild the infrastructure like crazy, and they control every single little knob on that infrastructure. And, and this, this is actually a point that, that we're tracking and actually we're, we're promoting um, in, the, in the Crowbar work we're doing. Because Crowbar is not just, for us, it's not just about OpenStack, right? This, this problem that Matt's describing is not OpenStack specific. It's it's our customers, sorry, our leading customers, because they're the ones who are DevOps focused, um, are clearly you know, spending, making a big investment to get into this more of a continuous DevOps operations. And they're not looking at operating systems as distros anymore. They're looking at data centers as systems, right? I mean, I have the benefit of working with the, 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 the top data center, large scale hyperscale providers. So they don't look at individual boxes. They look at systems boxes. And so I think what, what we're seeing is this graduation that Matt's talking about from it being a distro into it being a system, a system tool. And that's that's really how we're looking at it. And, then, and one of the things I like about SUSE is I think SUSE is on the same page with this because they understand that you're, we're actually building an inter interconnected system. It's not just the one SUSE distro, it's the whole pieces. Um, and so. And that's something I wanted to put the I, you'd be surprised, but um, <laughs> because I talked, I talked to the operating system vendors, and they're still taking a distro approach to this. Yeah, um, they're taking an operating system distro, they're, right? Uh, an operating yeah, system distro. distro versus operating system. Right, and and so when when we look at what we're what we have to solve, and this is why pull from source toss is so important, is because it it lets it it breaks the pieces into smaller chunks, and the more we do that, the more. Um, our system is able to fit together well. I think uh, I, mean, I, I agree with you, but I, I think what's happening in the market is that the you know the, the companies, the big data center providers, right. you know, the rack spaces of the world, they have to do that. Um, and so there's a huge amount of work, and, and I know AT and T is moving into that direction and all that. I mean, I come from telco world, and you know the dial tone has to. There over a percent of the time, so they're kind of being forced into that. But the I think the underlying ecosystem of, as you say, the the, the serve the component providers aren't there yet, um, and and I think there's a lot of struggle around around you know because there's still piece parts that you have to kind of put together, and um, and and certainly at the at the enterprise level, it's a whole different ballgame because they're just not there. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think that the, what what I'm what I'm expecting is that over the next two years or three years, right, we're going to start seeing this tool chains become more and more repeatable for enterprises, and they're going to be able to adopt it where that's today they can, up. and that's when they'll sign up. And I, I'm not in a rush. Frankly, it's you know we need this time to get get these things right, get it working, and things like that. And the enterprises are going to jump in right away anyway. So. Well, another thing about that I find, I mean, this, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to the enterprise and we're going to talk about OpenStack. We, we're a rail shop. We don't, you know, we will, we will not take anything else into discussion. 
well, you know, you kind of have to think out of the box here. And they're like, we'll wait till Rel, you know, support on Rel, then we'll, you know, then we'll talk to you. You're probably getting horrible support on Rel. <laughs> or CISA support on Rel, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yes. anyway. So, I mean, it's yeah. a different well, mindset. Well. It's, it's a, remember, you know, the, 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 the providers, the Rackspaces, the Amazons, the Google, they're both doing all themselves, right? So, and they have the people to do it. The enterprise, you know, I call it the skilling of the IT organization, and this has been going on for 10 years. The enterprise, the, the IT organization is hollowed down. Yeah. I, mean, I worked with a major corporation that didn't have anybody on staff who knew how to do an IP network. Being yeah. like, I was like shocked. <laughs> um, and so they're, they're very conservative. They become very conservative because they just don't have the skills to do it. And they're like, well, we'll just hand it over to the service providers. And yeah. So, you know, and then people say, well, you know, I want it to work like Amazon. And I say, yeah, but Amazon's been doing it for 15 years. You know, you can't possibly catch up with them. Yeah. Well, but that you're basically completely reinforcing what Rob said. I, I was, yeah. whatever, we have various ways we help people. I was talking with a guy that I had to explain to what a VLAN is, because he was trying to deploy OpenStack with Crowbar, and he clicked all the buttons, and he came up, but um, we dynamically reconfigured the network, and he didn't realize that um, your switch has to be configured to yeah. move VLANs. So when you apply, but the funny thing is, he got OpenStack deployed to a point where it was trying to use VLANs and it blew up in his face when, like, what is a VLAN? Right. So basically the concept of getting, to, as opposed to if you look at the Diablo days, where to get to a point of getting anything in OpenStack kind of alive, you have to actually know uh, something. You have to spend weeks and troll through things. Yeah. So I think we're getting to a point, actually if you look at Hadoop, right? If you look at Hadoop, it's been around what for three years or so? A little uh, bit even more, right? Nice. So it's getting a lot of enterprise adoption now because you get the ecosystem and the single button install that whatever Cloudera and all the <coughs> other folks. And it's also a large distributed system with lots of moving parts and tuning parameters that you could spend weeks of trying to figure out. But you don't need to anymore. Right, for, for OpenStack, you still do, right? And Mirantes, I think, every time they speak up, they say, hey, that's how we make our money. We go help people deploy OpenStack. But if you look at the maturity level of the tooling around the core technology, that's, that's where, Open, where Hadoop got and where OpenStack is getting with Piston, Propar, and all those guys. But I think you were asking a question about half an hour ago. <laughs> right, does that make sense? Does that match what you've seen? Actually, if you look, you said you looked at uh, Red Hat, but if you look at Linux at the, on the desktop, right, if you look at six years ago, when you had to go build your own kernel and find the drivers to work on your hardware, you, know, you didn't have a whole lot of Linux adoption on, uh, outside of very crazy places, and now it's ubiquitous, right? I, I downloaded, I downloaded, uh, who was it? Where, where's that uh, Sputnik thing? Matt, where's your Sputnik, right? Oh. Dell, uh, Dell made a splash that uh, you can install Ubuntu on a Mac Air looking kind of a laptop and it, it's all working out of the box. Like, I tried on a piece of junk laptop that was on the, on the reject pile in my office and guess what, even, even the little volume buttons worked, I was amazed, right? If you look, even two years ago, if you tried to install Linux on a laptop, like nothing worked. And the maturity of the user experience of the first steps, like plunk in the CD, press a button, wait half an hour, and you got a cloud running. But Mirantis is, is working with the kind of the leading edge companies at this point. Well, if anybody's going to start that. Right. I mean, but it's, 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 a front, it's a frontier. Me, it's a frontier mentality, right? I mean, you you've yeah. got. So I mean, we're 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 building the first towns, right? We're building the first stage coach runs. Eventually, the railroads will come. Yeah. And 
and that's that's good. You know, that's and eventually awesome. you'll have Dallas, and we'll move away. It's okay. <laughs> you know, to the Texas jokes there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, for your next talk, one of my questions trying to get at you is there's really a lot of debate on what the what the barriers are in the real thing. It's really not like it's never going to be like this whole thing. I, the, the thing that's really exciting to me about this is that it's OpenStack showed up at, the, at, at just at a good time when the DevOps tooling was in place that and the DevOps understanding was in place and there was a mind swell of it that we're actually using the lessons from cloud deployments in physical infrastructure deployments really to me for the first time because even the Hadoop stuff we do even it's it's just old enough that, that people had already done a whole bunch of work that wasn't really DevOpsy. And so our Hadoop deployment, while it still uses a lot of the infrastructure, yeah. doesn't have the same feel that our OpenStack deployments do because they came just enough later that we could take all those great DevOps continuous deployment things and start productizing it as a deployment infrastructure. And so, um, so to a large degree, that's what OpenStack itself is. Right? OpenStack is a whatever. But, brainchild of DevOps because it takes a bunch of other tools and automates and APIs. True, but, but, a yeah, but the, the thing that's really interesting to me is instead of just limiting it to the cloud level like people do with an Amazon deployment or a Eucalyptus deployment, what what we're doing is we're actually, and by, by design, I mean the OpenStack against hardware is the same thing. We're trying to get it all to go full stack. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to be bumpy, but I think that because of where we are with it, we're at an advantage. Um, you know, I people talk about OpenStack being hard to deploy. You know, I've, our, our team has had the benefit of doing other cloud infrastructures that were open before OpenStack, and we have more, made more progress in OpenStack deployability and focus on operations. Right, in part because we got involved really early as with Ops Focus, um, than any of those other cloud infrastructures, and, and I, I think that that pays off. It's, you know, it's paying off in OpenStax adoption, too. I, I would agree with you on that, cause, and I can state some, some things where where I can see, you know, the last couple of years, there's been a couple of things where, you know, the corporation is like, just give me something that works. So we block came along, right. and, and look what's happening. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah because look at the barrier to entry to be blocked, right? You're talking well, about exactly substantial investment. In fact, one of, the, one of the people that I'm talking to today, that's exactly why they want to Look at uh, OpenStack, uh, you know, specifically to get away from to get away from the, the VMware and the cost of all that, you know, infrastructure. Right, and in the end of the day, VBlock is still just a rack of hardware. It doesn't have any of the other supporting things to, to to get it actually working. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people they they drop a million dollars on a POC, it sits in the gathering dust because it was blocked by the infrastructure guys. And, every, and the, the company's like, well, what are we using this thing for? So <laughs> it has to be driven from the, from the other side. We'll get there. I'll we'll get there. Yeah. All right. Short term. <laughs> These are things that I'm working on like this week. One, yeah, last week and next week. Uh, DocsOpsCode.com. You know, I mentioned the Chef Robot Stack Docs are moving to the OpsCode Docs. So they will have a real URL and there'll be somewhere it'll say open stack. Uh, Fulsome, I'm merging from AT&T primarily, but my code base in AT&T started in different places. So, you know, uh, doing that. And Dreamhost, and Carl promised me a lot of patches uh, and then went silent. Are you looking at uh, our Folsom stuff? Not really. I just... Okay. <laughs> How I, I mean, I haven't lately, but I will. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you it, it's it. hidden. It's it's you. You need to I know mean, what you're looking for. The only thing I've pulled from you is the Swift uh, bar frame. Okay. So I know I know that that is just a black box to me right now. And, and some of some of what we're doing, I'll I'll, I'll interject now. I guess so. While you're very active on Fulsome, uh, our team is investigating. Because that's the way I have to say it. Uh, use doing Grizzly and being active in Grizzly development, yeah. um, and so uh, 
you know, we really, we really want to take the pull from source work we've been doing so we can be in the active code base for deployment and influence deployment. And I, yeah, I definitely want to move faster. I mean, you know, Essex, I didn't get Essex out until two months after it was, it was done. Right. You know? <laughs> I mean, I didn't get Essex cookbooks out until Folsom was released. You know, so I'm. So you know, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to scavenge, scavenge developers who might be helping you on Folsom per se, but. Um, I, you know, yeah, <laughs> I, I want to move faster. It's just, there's so much, so many you moving pieces. Yourself. I, I do. And I need to it just takes, it, you can, it just takes 18 years before they're productive developers. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 15, 15, yeah, they, they start, but they hack games at 15. That's, yeah. that's a productive uh, game. I was writing utilities at 12. <laughs> Yeah, first computer uh, in so yeah, uh, I, I should look at your code. Tell me uh, about I'm productive. I'm looking at ACT Dreamhouse and Rackspace because they all came off of Rackspace, you know, and that's where I came off. Of. You guys were a precursor right. to Rackspace, so I mean, you know, I, I <laughs> worked for and Rackspace, and then <laughs> no, Rackspace's Alamo project is very close to the SSO. You know, it's the same code base. Yeah. With you know a bunch of my patches to take out their opinions. Um, yeah, and, and we're we're moving to attribute driven. And yeah, uh, OpenStack Common is going to be a big change from Rackspace, and so it will be more in line with ATP host. And I will look at your stuff. Yeah. If it helps, so do you have Cinder in Quantum, or is there at least uh, one of these? ACT has Cinder for okay. LVM and NetApp. Um, okay. Rackspace has Cinder for LVM and NetApp too. I haven't looked at theirs, but they're not the same. We have Cinder. <coughs> we have Cinder for ecologic. Ecologic and, and LVM. LVM. So I'm happy to take you know, the code. And, you know, the, the Cinder stuff is not that crazy. Uh, quantum stuff. Uh, ATT does not have quantum cookbooks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Rackspace didn't, but apparently they do now. I have a look. Um, you know, DreamHost does, um, but they've been quiet for a while. DreamHost is using NYSERA. Um, at t is using some NYSERA. Um, I got a slide later that says, you know, NYSERA is paying off to write some cookbooks. So, you know, part of that will be we have to have a quantum cookbook. So there will definitely be a quantum cookbook in full set. I just don't have it yet. Yeah. And, those are the places I'll uh, And then, you know, long term roadmap. Docs, Grizzly, and Trunk. You know, that's kind of the source builds. You know, eventually I would like to get there. Uh, I was talking with uh, some of the tank guys last week. Um, they want to make sure that Seth is in everything we do. Uh, and they already have cookbooks. So, and, you know, since they're across the hall from Greenhost, yeah. Greenhost is already using those cookbooks. So, well, they're spun off from Greenhost. Yeah. I, I, they're literally on the same floor across the hall, um, and so they uh, they definitely Seth's support will come into Sender, and it will come in as a Swift alternative as well. Uh, Mitakura has cookbooks um, for their stuff. No one's asked me to use it yet, except for Mitakura. So, you know, I mean, I, I will be happy to to make sure the Quantum stuff supports that. Quantum is kind of you kind of have to have a financial, like, angle. Like, you know, the open. That's we've been debating that. Yeah, we're. we're I'm not we're trying to understand what you're trying to say, though. Yeah. The only people who are using quantum are using commercially supported quantum plugins, right? So it's not like I can say, oh, use the open source quantum. It's like, no, you're going to use my serum quantum. You're going to use Mutacur quantum. You're going to use. Big switch. switch. Big switch. Yeah, that's because one itself is it's just a plug in. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, there is, uh, they, they've made a lot of effort in supporting both uh, basic look, uh, sort of the Linux bridge and VLANs yeah, and kind of the like open horizon. source OBS. What's that? It's kind of like Horizon. Yeah, but I, we we have uh, motivation Ryu, to, to Ryu want our. Is the open source one? Sorry? Is Ryu the open source? Uh, uh, it's not completely open source. Ryu is NTT and it's uh, it's an it open flow controller. Yeah. It is, but you, it talks to Unix. Open Vswitch. Uh, they have an open source controller. Foglight. Yeah, no, so. Foglight's a Dell thing. No, there's a Foglight, but the okay. Big Switch 
Foglight is basically a framework for open flow controllers. Yeah. But it doesn't do anything for it by itself. <laughs> it's the framework they can build on top to create an open flow controller. Hence my reservations about Quash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one of the but things we were hoping to do with the Grizzly work is to actually have an open source well, portal. Right? The Nova networking stuff goes away. It's, no, it's, it's not, not it's going still, away. Still? Yeah, yeah it's they're, it's gonna be much harder to pull that weed out than uh, I mean, the, why am I not surprised? Yeah, it's I, because Cinder, Cinder was brilliant for the swap. That's yes. Nice. Yeah. No, but quantum. But that's a much more quantifiable chunk than than I mean, quantum is in everything. You got to run a network, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but you can keep using over network. Well, that's my point. Yeah. <laughs> no, but they they, they did the work on parity first. first. It's quantum. The yeah. Well, so qu only in Grizzly is quantum actually. At parity with no, okay. Nova Network, there were too many yeah. edge cases where I'm not sure it's going to work for me. So, so full might be like I do one or two point releases and start with my <laughs> That would that, uh, we would be behind you. Yeah, and yeah, I, I got quantum. I mean, if you think about it, quantum, you know, and self-defined networks in general is just so new that there's just a whole lot of moving parts, and they're just not really there yet. Mm. I mean, this this is this is the I there's a question and I don't I don't know the answer but it, we're hoping that we can find a way to do a moderate scale deployment using o completely open source and then have alternatives for people who want to grow their, their yeah deployments. and that's that's exactly what my goal is it's just yeah I need finding the time and having someone hand it to me works better. <laughs> I, this is why we need to just we. You, I mean, our teams need to get back in sync so that our we can use the upstreams and vice versa. We're 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 close. Yeah, the problem is everyone moves fast. So it's like uh, hypervisors. You know, it would be cool to get Hyper B in there. Uh, you know, Calzadum might just show up and hand me bare metal. That's what happened with you know the other stuff. They're like, oh, this and this, set that, and all my LXC stuff worked. And LXC was just documentation. Just, here's what you know. We tested it for you. Here's what you needed to do, and now it works. Um, and you know, they obviously care about bare metal because you know, arms uh, Databases. You guys have Postgres. We, uh, the SUSE version SUSE does, guys, yeah. and and what we are doing is we're, <coughs> we're going to switch to Postgres uh, for licensing. Reasons yeah. predominantly, but um, we're trying to do it with an abs uh, with the, a cookbook that's abstracted, so that you can actually the, the, the SUSE cookbook Commons. is actually bolt. You yeah. can flip it. OpenStack Commons is using the database cookbook and supports SQLite, MySQL, Postgres. Right. Um, ATP doesn't care. You know, Primo said they want to switch to Postgres. Um, uh, Qualcomm said they would use Postgres. We have a distinct preference. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. of the licensing. Opscode you know, prefers Postgres. But, you know. So it'll have kind of stuff where nobody, you know, it's like, uh, it'll, it'll be It'll be in our Grizzly stuff. We're, okay. we're switched. It, it should so be. We, we are switching. It's just getting it done. And the, you know, on the Opscode Chef cookbook side, the Postgres and MySQL ones are fairly. Uh, they get a lot of patches and are well, you know, frequently released, well supported, and the database code. They're all kind of in lockstep now. Yeah. Good. Uh, operating systems. We've already talked about this. Yeah. Um, there's a. There is a. The Debian. Uh, uh, OpenStack maintainer uses the Alamo stuff. So. He tried. He tried to send them some patches. So I told him, "Yes, send them to me." Um, and HA configurations. You know, Folsom came out with uh, Florian houses. You know, hey, this is HA. It's you know, it's what I call lab HA. You know, it's kind of like, hey, this is good if you're running a small. You know, if you were at the last uh, summit, you know, Florian and uh, Randy Bias kind of went back and forth about. What HA is? Um, Everybody goes back and forth. Great. Well, you know, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, I, I, I and I told Randy, I said, if you open source your cookbooks, we will use your stuff. They have not open sourced this, um, or documented it for you know, external consumption. Okay, we're not selling it yet. Oh well, they're deploying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, cloud scaling is definitely using Chef, but they have written a parallel Chef server 
for Chef Solo uh, because they don't like Chef Server. But they have a server that deploys cookbooks and keeps nodes in sync, which is what Chef Server does. Um, it's OK. Everyone does that. Engineer did that. Broken did that. Uh, skip. Yeah, Little Chef, Street Chef, uh, there's High Chef. There are several implementations of Chef Server. Eventually, I'll come back around. Uh, Chef Docs, you know, the documentation's there. I'm trying to finish up the Essex stuff, hopefully, and have that well documented so I have grounds to pivot it to full stuff. Um, are you missing an open? Oh, it's just moving to Chef Docs and then it'll be up and stack under Chef Docs. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's moving to the big Chef Docs repo. So I need to have a talk with our doc writer. Apparently, our PDFs have been getting versioned. Uh, and stored in GitHub, and so if you if you get this project, it's like a gig of documentation. This is how you can work. Yeah, yeah, because it has every single thing. So you can build like just little silos of the documentation if you want. I mean, you know, the main file in there for this stuff is good. But uh, what's cool is you know it gets it's you know spit out continuously. So. Your patches get merged to Chef Docs. They show up on the you know, docsobstacle.com the next day or two. Uh, if you check that project out, you can build, in addition to HTML, you can build PDFs, EPUB, um, it's Sphinx. So if you're familiar with Sphinx documentation, uh, it uses uh, restructured text, and you can spit it out into like professional grade documentation. Yeah. Um, Multi-page, yeah. PDFs, EPUBs, whatever. So it's nice. Let's take a break. Uh, it's 45. That is that is the quick summary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've got deeper dives on most everything else. And then let's uh, you know take a couple minute break. Let's sit down. The Dell, the Dell guys need to be on a short call awesome. at one o'clock. Last one we'll pick what to do. <laughs> <laughs>